Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers to, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here to trade in the rain of the Northwest for a little desert sunshine um, and talk about the update on the recent treatments of strategic targeting of GIST. So I'd like to review briefly the background and molecular biology of GI stromal tumors. These are much more uncommon than the uh, other ca cancers that have been discussed this morning. Talk about frontline therapy for metastatic disease. Talk about adjuvant therapy. Talk about imatinib resistant disease, um, both molecular mechanisms and medical management. So GIST are a mesenchymal gut neoplasm or a form of sarcoma, which are now recognized as a distinct uh, clinical pathologic entity. Um, they, the cell likely arises or shares a common ancestor with the interstitial cells of a cahal, which are these specialized pacemaker cells in the gut which organize slow wave peristalsis. Um, the, these tumors most pre commonly present as a gastric mass. Increasingly, we see incidental GIS with uh, more widespread uh, availability of uh, EUS um, and EGD. Um, and these are much more uncommon than the other cancers we've discussed. We think that the annual U.S. incidence is five to 7,000 cases, and so I would imagine that the average oncologist in this room probably has one to two GI cancer patients per hour, but maybe only one to two total GIST patients in their practice panel, or at least that seems to be fairly common uh, for most people in um, private practice. Um, and Prior to 2000, these were treated with sarcoma, as sarcomas with high-dose chemotherapy with, to no effect. The response rate to chemotherapy of these tumors is less than 1%. Now, what we have learned biologically is that most GIST have a mutation of either the KIT receptor tyrosine kinase in about 80% of tumors or in the PDGFR-related uh, gene in about 8%. Um, so overall, about 86% of GIST have a mutation of one or the other, which is good because our drugs target these mutations. However, that still leaves 14% of GIST lacking a mutation, um, which we call wild-type GIST. But we've now realized that wild-type GIST is at least 10 different, more less common uh, types of GIST. So as we'll come to the theme of sort of molecular medicine is that we start with something that was pretty small, and by the time we parse it out molecularly, we end up with 15 different diseases, which in this case has some nuances in terms of treatment. These mutations, because they're gain of function, um, can only exist in certain domains. Um, so the most common site is KID exon 11 um, GIST, about 70% of GIST. Um, this is a bad thing in the untreated state because it's predictive of recurrence, but it, or it's, prognostic, it's a bad prognostic thing to try to follow the correct uh, nomenclature, but it is very predictive of response to TKIs. Um, the next most common mutation is the KID exon 9, um, which, is, which is noteworthy because using data from randomized trials, we now realize that this type of GIST requires a different starting dose of imatinib which was the point of the question, and we'll come back to that. So what is the, what is the purpose of KIT? So it, KIT is a receptor tyrosine kinase. I guess the, this is the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. Um, this is a ligand binding domain. This is an enzymatic domain. Now, normally, this is a growth factor receptor. So if there's no ligand around, it's not doing anything. It's just hanging out in the membrane. However, in the presence of di dimeric ligand, then two of these molecules come together and the act of binding the growth factor actually twists the extracellular domain, transmitting a signal to the intracellular uh, enzymatic kinase domain, which activates uh, the protein and leads to incessant signaling. Um, this is upstream because it's at the top or at the membrane, and so it signals down through the RAS pathways, the PI3 kinase pathways, STAT pathways, um, other pathways, and it, we believe that this is what gives rise to GI stromal tumors and what continues to drive their proliferation and survival even in advanced disease. Now, in the case of GI stromal tumors, rather than having a wild-type receptor, you have a mutated receptor 
which is constitutively active. And the difference between this slide and the previous slide is that no growth factor ligand is present, and so this thing is turned on all the, all the time, similar to mutations of RAS or BRAF, um, which result in incessant uh, uncontrolled signaling. Now, therapeutically, we exploit this because imatinib or other tyrosine kinase inhibitors are ATP mimetic. They come in and bind to where ATP, which is the power supply for this protein, would bind, turning, turning off the enzyme and ending, ending the signaling. So this is very similar to why, how we treat CML or how we treat melanoma these days uh, using kinase inhibitors, which are very specific for the oncogene related to that tumor. Now, if we went back in time 14 years ago, there wasn't an, even a disease of, called GI stromal tumors. These were actually called leiomyosarcomas or lumped in with leiomyosarcomas because it's felt that they were a smooth muscle tumor, but then we decided that they weren't. Um, so we were very pleased to have a new diagnosis, but now we realize that not all gists are the same. Um, and this is increasingly the theme of modern medicine. Not all lung cancers are the same. Not all breast cancers are the same. Not all colon cancers are the same. So it's really a heterogeneous collection of molecular entities which have in common a similar histology and a presumed cell of origin. Most, but not all GIST, or at least we can't understand in all GIST, most GIST are driven by a pathogenetic mutant kinase, usually KIT, but sometimes PDGFRA. And the type of underlying molecular defect in a given GIST has a significant impact on how they respond to treatment and also potentially on how they can be resistant to treatment. So what is the frontline treatment of metastatic GIST? Currently it's imatinib. These are summary data from the pivotal trial which started in 2000. And in, so in this trial, patients with metastatic GIST, 147 patients were randomized to either take imatinib 400 or 600. These were kind of made up doses from um, CML trials. 83% of patients showed a clinical benefit. Remember that the response rate to chemotherapy is less than 1%, so this was obviously a very big signal. The median time to progression in this study uh, was 84 weeks. In randomized trials, it's more like 20 to 24 months. Um, the median overall survival of this phase two study was 57 months, um, and one important part of the study is because we had never given imatinib or Gleevec to non-CML patients at that time, we didn't really know what would happen given it to people missing parts of their small bowel, their stomach, or parts of their liver, but the safety profile is very similar to what we see in CML. In long-term follow-up, 14% um, of the patients remain progression-free uh, at nine years, and 35% of the patients are alive at nine years. In the last two weeks, I've seen three patients from our original phase two who are now going into their 13th year of treatment for advanced metastatic disease um, and continue to do well, although now we have problems that patients who were 83 at the time of we started the trial are now 96, and finding it a little bit more difficult to travel multi-states to come to our center. This was definitely a game changer for survival. This is just the early results. Um, the green curve is imatinib. The blue curve is chemotherapy, which is inactive. So basically, this is the natural history shift from the chemotherapy era to the targeted therapy uh, era. Now, I don't have time to go through all the data, but if you parse through the phase three data and you look at the molecular subgroups, it turns out that everybody does well on imatinib 400, except for patients who have a KID exon 9 mutation who do less well, but they do much better if they're treated with 800 milligrams. And it turns out in a test tube that the exon 9 kinase is harder to drug and simply requires a higher drug level um, than is routinely achieved at standard dose 400. And so based on these, these data, you know, we would recommend, recommend imatinib 400 for any kit mutant gist, except for patients with kit exon 9, um, which we recommend 800 milligrams. Kit exon 9 mut mutant gist are almost all confined to the small bowel or colon, um, and so that's sort of a, a tip off to someone who you might want to consider molecular testing on um, because it will make a dosing change. 
Now, once we established, you know, the, the oncology paradigm is once something works in metastatic disease, of course, we think that it should work after surgery. Again, surgery is the curative disease um, for GIST and for many GI cancers. And so we would like to take advantage of what the surgeon can do and add our own little extra medical, uh, you know, whipped cream on top of that. Um, and so the initial uh, attempt at adjuvant therapy of GIST was a study performed by Akaza, uh, known as Z9001, which basically took any GIST greater than three centimeters, and we'll come back to that point because some of these GISTs were incredibly low risk and probably don't deserve adjuvant therapy. Um, I'll get to that point in a minute. But be that as may, in the trial, any GIST greater than three centimeters, which had an R0 resection, was randomized, the patients were randomized to take imatinib 400 for one year or take placebo. Uh, the endpoint was relapse-free survival. <clears throat> so in the initial presentation of the data, you can see that there is a significant um, hazard ratio down to 0.35, um, indicating that relapse-free survival is improved by taking imatinib for one year. But if you look carefully at this curve, so up to about here, the people on the top curve are still taking imatinib. And so there's an incredibly low relapse rate while you're taking imatinib, um, whereas the patients in the placebo arm, the lower curve, are, some of them are relapsing um, you know, from the time of randomization. But in the imatinib arm, after about 20 months, um, so about eight months off your adjuvant therapy, you start to see relapses occur and the curves come much closer together. Um, and we're still not sure ultimately if these curves will merge. Um, so we don't really know from the study, did we just delay relapses or did we actually prevent some? Based on this study, um, imatinib was approved uh, by the FDA for adjuvant treatment. Um, interesting, the label totally departed from the trial, which was one year, and they said basically indefinite treatment's okay with us. Um, but the main conclusions I would say is that re re recurrence-free survival is improved, overall survival was not improved, and the therapy was safe and well tolerated, so you could certainly give it to patients postoperatively and not uh, change their surgical outcomes. Um, now, one thing point I want to return to as we sort of parse through this data is that there are big differences in the risk of recurrence. So the, the big three factors are where it arises, stomach is lower risk than anywhere else, how big it is, obviously bigger is worse, and something called the mitotic index, which is the number of mitosis per 50 high-powered field. And we, we, the sort of danger, danger zone is five per 50. So if you d dissect out all of the GISs based on where they arise, how big they are, and their mitosis, you arrive at this table, which you can see that some patients with small GISs have essentially a 0% chance of recurrence, and some patients with higher, uh, larger GISs, especially of the small bowel with high mitotic index, have close to a 90% risk of relapse. Um, so just to highlight this, in the case of a gastric GIST, um, of some size, between five and 10 centimeters, but with a low mitotic index, the risk of recurrence is less than 4%. Um, however, if the same size tumor was downstream in the small bowel, the risk of recurrence was 24%. Um, and if this tumor was of the same size but had a higher mitotic index in the stomach, um, there'd be a 55%. And so as we get through some more of the adjuvant data, I think it's important to use, this is the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, but there are at least five different um, risk assessment tools, including an online one through Memorial Sloan Kettering um, from Dr. Gold's study that can help you assess risk. So if, for some patients with low risk of GIS, I would not recommend any form of adjuvant therapy. Some patients obviously have a very high risk of therapy and we want to do something. And based on the fact that high-risk GIS have these 90, 70, 86% risk of recurrence, we ask the next question, which we always ask in adjuvant therapy, well, if it works, what if we just do more of the same? And so the uh, Scandinavian sarcoma group in uh, conjunction with the German sarcoma group, ran a randomized trial which took, asked the question, is three years better or the same as one year? 
Um, now, these were high-risk GISs, so these weren't any comer, small three-centimeter GISs. These were patients that had at least a 50 to 70 percent risk of recurrence. Um, so this is a completely different population. The primary endpoint was relapse-free survival. Now, as you can see, that the three-year treatment arm, which is the upper curve with a very low hazard ratio, did much better. Again, what you'll notice, though, that there are very few relapses during the three-year arm while you're actually taking the drug. After you discontinue adjuvant therapy, you do see this fall off, although the curves remain separated in time, and there's still a big difference at five years between one year of treatment and three years of treatment. Somewhat unexpectedly, this early in the study, there actually was a statistically significant improvement in survival, um, about a 10% overall gain in survival at five years, although the number of deaths in either arm was very small, as you might imagine, because our treatment for metastatic disease is quite good, and even now, the overall survival in metastatic disease is five to seven years. So it's a little bit intriguing that this early in a study that there could be a difference in deaths because we would assume that we could rescue people pretty efficiently um, at the time of relapse. Um, and so it, this leads us a little bit unsure of what to do. What is the optimum duration of therapy? Based on this trial, you know, I would argue that the limit of evidence is that for high-risk GIS, we treat for three years. For lower-risk GIS, consider one to three years. And for patients at very low risk of recurrence, um, which to me is less than 5%, I would argue that no treatment would be reasonable as well. Um, it's been proposed to, that five years might be better. There are ongoing trials of that. It's been proposed, although there's no trial proposal, that indefinite treatment might be better, um, which is sort of a hard concept to sell, especially if you see a 40-year-old patient and say, we think that the optimal therapy is to take this drug and your life expectancy is currently 45 to 50 years, and so we want to prescribe this drug for the next 50 years of your life. What to do in metastatic disease after frontline therapy with imatinib? Um, so this comes in different flavors. Patients who relapse within the first six months of therapy who have primary resistance usually do so because their GIST is one of these molecular subtypes that does not respond too well to imatinib. Wild type GIST, the kid exon nines who got 400 as opposed to 800, or more rare flavors of GIST that are intrinsically kinase resistant. Secondary or delayed resistance is that progression that develops after initial disease response. And just like CML, it's commonly associated with the development of secondary kinase mutation. So we're drugging it. The tumor wants the enzyme turned back, so it mutates the enzyme so it can go back on. So they're addicted to KIT. They want to restore their addiction. What to do about that? Treat Escalating the dose of imatinib can help. Um, sometimes drug levels are low, and getting a higher drug level can help. Um, trying to figure out how many tumors there are and talk to your friend the surgeon and see if it would be reasonable to consider surgery. Um, conventional versus PET imaging can help you sort that out. You could consider local therapy such as surgery or radiofrequency ablation. Um, if none of those are appealing, possible, or work, then second-line medical therapy would be to switch to sunitinib. Now, one thing to kind of keep in mind as you're debating surgery is that it's important to keep in mind what type of pattern of progression do you have. So these tumors that with the white stars, that means they're happy tumors. When we treat with imatinib, we typically see these black holes in the liver. They're very uh, hypocellular. But when people progress, they can either progress because all of the tumors are growing one of the tumors are, is growing, or more commonly we see that only one little portion of a tumor is growing uh, because this is a clonal outgrowth of a drug-resistant tumor. We follow this over time, and of course we'll get bigger, but initially it can present as a very small nodule. Now, if you take people to surgery um, who are progressing on TKIs, how they do after surgery depends completely on how they were doing before surgery. So the top curve is progression-free survival. The bottom curves are overall survival. The top curve is stable disease. So if you go into surgery and your disease was medically controlled, then you do well after surgery. Although, as I told you, some of my patients have done 13 years well without ever having surgery. And if I had done surgery 10 years ago, 
they still would be doing well, they just would have had surgery. And so it's difficult to know whether the surgery in this case is adding anything or not. Now, if you have people who have limited disease progression and you do surgery, then you have reasonable progression-free survival, um, but most people will have something else start growing within the next year or two. If you go into surgery with multiple tumors growing, so there's no medical control at all, then essentially as soon as they heal up from their surgery and have a scan, they will have progressed somewhere else. And so surgery is certainly not a panacea. It can be morbid, um, especially when you're doing these extended uh, peritoneal and hepatic resections, so you have to be very careful in selection. So in terms of medical therapy, this phase three randomized placebo-controlled study identified sunitinib as the uh, second line active therapy. Blue curve is sunitinib, red curve is placebo. You gained um, <clears throat> 20 weeks compared to placebo to take sunitinib. Third line therapy, <coughs> regorafenib was um, approved for colon cancer in December. It was approved as third line therapy for just uh, several weeks ago. As previously comment commented on, uh, regorafenib is either fluoroserafenib or serafenib is defluororegorafenib. They're highly related. <clears throat> Again, a phase three trial was conducted. Everybody had previously been treated with imatinib and sunitinib. Regorafenib plus best supportive care versus placebo. Progression-free survival. Um, the placebo arm patients progressed in one less than one month. Patients taking regorafenib progressed at uh, with a median of 4.8 months. There was no survival difference because there was a crossover. <clears throat> it is a very active agent. I have had a few patients from the early phase two study who have gone two years or now three years of therapy, um, but it does have a fair amount of toxicity, especially at the dosing recommended, which is start at 160 and go down. A lot of people can't take 160 or 120 and end up at 80. A more conservative approach might be to start at 80 and, and go up, depending upon the performance status of your patients. What to do after regorafenib? It's good to talk to an expert, consider investigational agents. There are other approved agents that have activity of some type reported in various phase twos. Consider local therapy or go back to something. We've learned that being on something that doesn't work is, being, is better than being on nothing at all um, because it is palliative. So as I tell my patients, if you're, going, if you're in a car going 60 miles an hour and you're gonna go off a cliff, and your brakes, and you can't stop the car, it's better to be going 30 miles an hour because you have longer um, to think about how you can solve your problem. Eventually, you're still gonna hit the point you don't want to, but literally, I've seen people who have progressive disease, their oncologist stops their disease, and it explodes in a month. It goes like five times the increase seen in the previous year just with three months of off therapy. To summarize, just as uh, heterogeneous, we think tumor genotyping will help you select the correct dose. Adjuvant imatinib treatment does improve progression-free survival, but there's quite a bit of patient selection that needs to go into it. Um, and ultimately, currently, in the metastatic setting, it's drug resistance that's the limiting factor uh, for overall survival. Thank you. <clears throat>